following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. Break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your hosts, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, Mark Sebastian from optionpit.com, Mike Tusa from KnowYourOptionsInc.com and John Grigas from Options Express. And welcome to the Option Block. Um, Mark Longo is on assignment. Uh, I've got him uh, exploring the uh, whether there's any uh, buying opportunities in rats in uh, the in the New York subway. So. He's trying to figure out whether he wants to get long or short uh, rat populace futures um, based on, and he's doing some legwork in, uh, in New York. So today it's just going to be uh, me, Mark Sebastian, uh, Mike Tussaw from Know Your Options Incorporated, and of course, John Grigas of Option Express. So guys, uh, with that, let's get into our first segment, the trading block. The trading block. You know, we had our first kind of uh, decent, real moving day in in several days. Uh, you know, the market over the last you know week has been doing a whole lot of nothing. It, it's hard to host. It's been so boring that it's been really hard <laughs> to host a podcast on the market because there's been nothing to talk about. Um, I don't know, Mike, are you, what are you seeing out there? Well, I mean, we had uh, crude oil futures coming off the two-month highs on Monday or today, and you, you could make the case that a lot of it is with the fact that the, um, <clears throat> that the euro is coming down. Uh, we, you're absolutely right. This is actually the first sign of life or death in the market and quite a while it seems and mm -hmm. uh, there's really no one thing that sticks out uh, just the one thing that I thought outside I mean in the market there was no one thing that was really sticking out in the stock market uh, the thing that I was noticing most of most of uh, more than anything was the euro and it's not a huge move in it in comparison to what it's been doing lately but uh, the euro is just kind of coming off a little bit just like the market has if you look at a chart of the euro uh, it's been pretty much straight up since September 10th for the most part, and just finally today we had a little bit of a pullback in it. So that's probably the main thing that I thought caught my eye besides the, the fact that we had a pullback in the stock market for the first time in a while as well. Yeah, and to jump on what you were saying about a crude oil, you know, I've been watching that, and my reasoning behind crude oil's run-up has been the sell-off in the dollar and the value of the dollar. Today we see a big rise in the uh, dollar, uh, the decent contract front month trade in 78.66, uh, you know, up about 34 cents. Where, where's the sell-off in the uh, in the crude oil? It didn't happen. So, where, where's the correlation between the dollar and the crude? I, I know you said the euro sold off well today, but you know, crude oil price in dollar terms, shouldn't we have seen a sell-off in uh, crude today? Yeah, yeah, you know, you would have thought so. Yeah, I guess you know what I'm thinking with that. Uh, when you're looking at the at the chart of oil. Yeah, theoretically, but just maybe this could be a bullish sign for crude and that the fact that even though the euro is coming down, maybe this is just more of a continuation factor on the crude front. Interesting, interesting point. Yeah, you know, that we've actually been seeing uh, more and more interest in kind of currency options. You know, the ICE has their FX options, and then there's options on a lot of these double short, double longs, and then just FX players in general. Um, it, that market, you know, it was always kind of a big thing, but it's it, it starting, I feel like it's, it's exploding in, in the U.S. the way kind of options did, uh, you know, several years ago. Uh, 
at Option Express, do you guys do a lot of FX stuff, and, and have you seen any pickup in, uh, in kind of the number of people interested in FX trading? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ever since, uh, you know, there was talk of, uh, you know, sovereign debt default in Europe uh, with, with Greece, Spain, and uh, Ireland, you know, all, all uh, running the risk of defaulting on, on, their, uh, on, their, on their government debt, um, you know, with the euro, I think it traded down to uh, 119 uh, when that flash crash occurred on May 6th. We had a big sell-off. It tested that and broke through it. I remember at that time I was selling, um, you know, getting good premium on selling the 115 puts in the euro, and I couldn't even hold it to expiration because I was so worried that, uh, you know, that I was going to get assigned on that because it, it was going down at a, at a pace I've never seen before. But I guess that's why you get the good premiums for the puts. Um, we have seen an uptick in interest in retail interest in the currencies. Um, you know, we do trade futures at Options Express, options on those currencies as well. But what has been a big uh, contribution to the interest in the currency market has been the Philex World Currency Options. Um, a lot of people don't like to go into futures and something they don't understand. Here you have a product that is priced similar to equities. Um, and I think I believe they're cash settled. You guys can correct me on there because I know there's two different types of. Uh, Currency options mm -hmm. out there, the ICE and the and the Philex World Currency options, but those have seemed to be the more popular one because of the fact I think that they're cash settled. We've seen a major uptick. You know, the euro, uh, you got the Swiss franc, Aussie dollar, mm -hmm. um, the yen, and about two other ones that they trade over there, all been very popular. Oh yeah, definitely. Those have been hugely popular. Actually, interestingly enough, um, one of the uh, just to kind of wrap up this this kind of discussion on the dollar. One of the most actively traded uh, contracts today, and certainly a huge call to put ratio was UUP, which is the Power Shares uh, Double U.S. Dollar uh, Bullish Index. We saw a ratio of 14 to one calls to puts, and uh, you know heavy buying up and down with a big bulk trade uh, on the uh, the Jan uh, 22 the the Jan 2011, uh, 24 calls. Uh, big, big, big buying on those. There's been actually huge buying over the last few days. We've seen just the open interest, um, you know, just kind of skyrocketing on that. Um, so, and, and, and continuing to skyrocket. So there appear to be a lot of people either shorting the dollar and hedging with the 24 calls or straight up buying the 24 calls. Um, you know, if, if based on the uh, kind of the short termness, how quickly? When was the last time the dollar, the the UUP got up over 24? Not that long ago, just in August. So, uh, you know, that looks like a decent bet. If you think that the dollar is gonna gonna the double long dollar is gonna blow up through you know 24, buying the Jan 2011 24 calls for 18 19 cents is not a bad little bet. And that could be why we've seen so much volume on that one line in particular. The open interest of, you know, going into today was about 120,000 contracts. That is way bigger than any other line, uh, you know, it, by a it's long worse, shot. Not even close, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's so, something similar. I, the 25 call, what, has 12,000 in open interest? So, I mean, you're talking mm -hmm. 10 times that for the 24 strike. Yeah. Uh, the next closest thing is the D's 24s, where there's there's some big open interest, but that's about it. So uh, there's some big, big, big players betting on uh, a little bit of a dollar rally, um, or like I said, they could be hedging. But uh, a play like that in a double double dollar bullish index doesn't seem as much of a play as it is a gamble. Well, I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, and that's one to where it's just been running so much, and you know I. How, it's, it's hard to say in that, but um, it's hard to really want to the dollar. It's hard to want to be long the dollar right now, long term. But when you look at it, it just had such that trend um, to the downside on the UUP, for example. That mm -hmm. um, it's one to where if we get some type of a, of, a, of a turnaround, if we just get back to the levels to where we were at the beginning of the of September, then that 18 cents is sure looking like a lot more than 18 cents in a hurry. Yeah, well, you know, interestingly enough, we are trading right around the lows of 2010 for the dollar. Um, it, or the UUP is trading around the lows of 2010, um, not the dollar. 
Uh, so it certainly could be some bullish bets. Um, and with that, let's get into the odd block. The odd the block. block. <laughs> and uh, obviously this is the segment where we're going to talk about kind of some strange trades that we were seeing. And the first one is Sarah Lee Corp. Uh, there was a rumor out there today that KKR, the private equity firm, um, it made an unsolicited offer to buy the firm. And then uh, Unilever also seems to be interested in Sarah Lee Corp. Uh, and with that, we saw bullish buying on uh, the November 15 calls. And we saw some buying on the Jan 15 calls as well as, uh, you know, a little buying in October. Mostly the big, big one was the, uh, the November 15 calls, who had quite the variance in implied volatilities today. Um, the implied volatility going in this morning, uh, as, at the close of business on, on Friday, was 23 on the November 15th. It's now 33. And, you know, that's a decent little jump. Uh, so... There's definitely some something going on there. What do, what do you guys think? Yeah, those uh, 15 no calls, 7,000 uh, volume today. That's that's, uh, that's that's big for Sarah Lee when you look across the board and there's nothing else going on in that uh, series of options. I thought they were coming out with a donut that didn't affect your waistline. That was the rumor. <laughs> here. So I don't know, takeover rumors, uh, fat-free donuts, I don't know. Yeah, well, I, think, I think either of those would be... Okay, yeah, either of those. guys, I, I needed to go to lunch, and I really was hungry, so word got out <laughs> where I was going for lunch, and so that's where all the call buying went. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. I love it. Um, we also saw some interesting buying in uh, Dean's Foods. This is another one that, you know, rarely traded, not that popular, and one line in particular is just really big. Um, I don't know if it's that guy hedging that's short, but... If you look at Dean's Foods, there is no open interest. And then, what pops out of you in in, uh, in January on uh, the you know the Jan 12 calls? Not 8,500 more trade a day, and the open interest on that strike 37,500. Next closest thing is probably next closest strike is less than a third of that, and the average strike is probably less than one tenth of that. Yeah, how do you explain um, such uh, volume and open interest on that? I mean, that's just there's zero across the board. There's 8,500 done. Do you think that's done in one trade, or is that? Yeah, I mean, we saw a, um, you know, I I have no idea. It's got to be either a, uh, you know, my guess is is that it's somebody that's got a, a big axe to grind on this thing. Um, if you look at a chart of this of Dean Foods. It is not been a pretty one. Um, you know, <laughs> they came out. Strangled. Yeah, I, I mean, they came out. Uh, if you look, they had just an awful earnings last May, where the company basically lost uh, a third of its value in one day. I mean, that is just a, a major thing. And this guy could be basically just betting that it's going to. Gonna, he's going to get his money back. He may just want to own stock if this thing starts running back over 12 and a half. Um, other option, he's just selling stock and doesn't want to have to, doesn't want to, it could be just doing the, the synthetic put. I don't know. What are, you, what are, your, what are your thoughts, Mike? Well, it's, it's, if, you were, if he's buying all those calls and he's looking to get back, it's a, what we call, this is, this is an advanced technical term, revenge trading, to where you're in a stage <laughs> to where you're just looking to, i got to get my money back. And if the market just goes up to 11, then uh, by my calculations with all my stock holdings, this will get me back to, back to even, so to speak. So hopefully it's not a revenge trade, so to speak. Uh, I hate the, uh, and, and I think we're all guilty of doing them once or twice, you know. Yeah. Uh, once or twice a day, yep. Yeah, well. <laughs> So hopefully uh, for at that sure. level it's not a revenge trade. Uh, I like the idea of, I, I think it might be, like you had said, some type of a synthetic short type of a thing to where uh, maybe he's selling the call first and then maybe looking to buy some puts in, a, in another area perhaps. 
Mm -hmm. I would hope that it's some type of an advanced hedging or shorting of something. You would think. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and I'm just shocked that that has that that they haven't just murdered that. You'd think that the implied volatility on that line would just be so out of whack relative to every every other strike, and it's not. Um, you know, it's been kept pretty in line by the market makers. So, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, the other thing I've noticed, and this isn't really the odd block, but um, even with kind of the down day that we're continuing to have, we're seeing massive, massive uh, put to call ratios on all the index on all the ETF and indexes. Um, IWM traded uh, five times as many puts as uh, it did calls. EM same thing. Uh, we're seeing it in all the, you know, XLK, XRT, um, you know, XLF, SPX, and it, it, all of them, big, big, big put-to-call ratios. Um, uh, you know, just kind of, kind of interesting that we're seeing a lot of distrust of this rally. Um, and I, I don't know if that technically qualifies as the odd block, but uh, you know, for us to have continued massive put buying like this, I think, is a little irregular in the middle of a rally like this. Yeah, I mean, it looks like the market's maybe rolling over or topping out, and, you know, maybe today was the first day of a reversal in the in the short-term trend that we've had. Um, you know, we've had a lot of retail clients calling and buying puts. I mean, where's the where's the good news that's, you know, that's, that's pushing this market higher and all the markets and higher? Um, is it anticipation of the uh, elections in November that we're going to get some type of uh, Senate or House change? But, I mean, I haven't seen any great news, any hiring going on. I know they pushed the non-farm payrolls back a week, but, you know, people are becoming skeptical of an of a 8% rally in September in the Dow, and they want to know, you know, hey, I'm buying some puts. I'm going to hedge either my portfolio or I'm going to take a bet that this thing's going to correct itself. Yeah, that definitely seems to be the feel. I it just... We, we never got through the 11, we never, I shouldn't say we never got through it, but we never closed above the 1150 level on the SPX. And mm -hmm. uh, right now, the fact that that's a key number uh, really makes you kind of raise an eyebrow, and I think it just emphasizes the importance of being careful in times like this in the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, we've been, it's been interesting. Uh, we were talking about this last week. Implied volatility has been rallying and rallying and rallying with the market. And... It is really odd to see that kind of aggressive um, rally in volatility. Uh, it, like, for instance, today we closed 11, uh, 11.37. We closed about there on, oh, we closed about there on the 22nd. And implied volatility is actually uh, is, is up significantly from the 22nd. Um, you know, the 30-day 30 30-day 30 implied vol on the 22nd was at about 18 percent, or at 20 percent. Um, a week later, and you know, same exact spot coming off a rally. That's a, that's a significant change for a big index. For some of these little small uh, products like, you know, a Kellogg's or a Halliburton or a Goldman, you know, two percentage points is not a big, big deal. It's a nickel or, or 10 cents. Two percentage points in the SPX, um, that's three or four bucks on the straddle. That's a major, major, major uh, volatility move. No doubt about it. It's <laughs> so, all right, well, and with that, let's... Go to, let's close up things with the odd uh, block and and move on to the OX block. The spread block, brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade futures and now foreign futures too, where and when you want. From advanced charting and free daily trading ideas to automated systems trading and free educational resources, Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Visit OptionsExpress.com to open your free account. Futures involve substantial risk and are not appropriate for all investors. Please read this disclosure statement for futures and options available at OptionsExpress.com slash futures risk or by calling 1-888-280-8020 prior to applying for an account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA.
Well, thanks there, uh, Mark. Uh, and usually what we uh, fill this segment with is what we've seen on the retail desk and, uh, you know, what, we're, what kind of calls we're fielding. Um, a couple of things we've already touched on, uh, you know, this gold rally that we've seen, uh, you know, if you look at a chart of gold, it, uh, it, it's just lower left, upper right. The thing has not pulled back in three and a half weeks here. Uh, a lot of people who already have accounts with us may not have futures accounts. Uh, they want to know how they can participate in this, and I'm sure you've seen news stories uh, last couple of weeks, last couple of months on how uh, the retail investor can participate in the gold or the metals rally here. Um, I myself, a commodities you know background, you know prefer to get into um, you know the gold itself or the silver market in the futures market. But if you didn't have futures set up in the account, which you can trade Options Express, you know people are jumping on these ETFs. We have the uh, GLD ETF uh, for gold and the SLV. Um, trades just like a, like a stock would. So if you're familiar with trading equities, you can definitely jump on board by buying uh, the GLD or SLV. Uh, if you're not into buying the outright uh, underlying, you can go out and buy options on these. Both of these products do have options um, and you know have done quite well. Um, I'm not sure where gold stopped trading or closed at today, but I got to imagine it's 13 plus. You know, it's uh, let me just pull up a quick quote. Dees Gold, which is the front month for the commodity. Uh, let's see where we're at here. Dees front month gold 131570, where it's currently trading at. It's got about a half hour left in the day. Oh wow! Uh, uh, you know, down 210. That's like the biggest pullback you've seen in gold. You know, it just it just does not go down. There's an underlying bid. You hear it on the news and on the billboards. Throw your gold into a you know, bag and mail it to us, and we'll send you back cash. It's uh, real popular right now. They're expecting you know analysts saying 1500, if not 2000, uh, in the next uh, six to 12 months. Um, I myself like to pick tops and would be buying you know puts in here, but um, you know it's a dangerous game when you're trying to pick a top and and go against the trend. But if mm -hmm. you didn't want to trade gold and silver options or uh, ETFs or futures for that matter, maybe you want to check out uh, interest rate futures uh, ETFs or, or energy ETFs. Um, Options Express, we do have an ETF center. Um, you just log into your account, go to ETF center. We have it. Uh, segmented by sector, which is pretty much easy as looking at a picture and say, hey, what, what, what type of sector am I looking at? Well, we've got gold bar obviously representing the metals. Uh, we've got a little flame representing uh, energies. You've got telecom, financials, uh, housing. But it puts, uh, when you go there, it puts the top uh, ETF for that segment. Um, like I said, SLV and GLD for the metals. Uh, you have TLT for uh, you know, your interest rates and uh, TBT. Um, you know, and I think USO is a big one for uh, crude oil. Um, besides ETF Center, you can also screen these uh, using our Options Express screener and go into that tool and put in, like, what type of price you're looking to pay, you know, different factors where it'll screen out these ETFs so you can find the one that meets, uh, you, you know, portfolio needs. Um, you guys ever trade ETFs? Do you have any interest in, uh, you know, these? They've, they've become quite popular over the last three years. I mean, pro shares uh, just has exploded. It seems like they come out with a new ETF almost every other day. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's been a huge moneymaker for, you know, a lot of people involved. Now, you have to be really careful with these ETFs. Uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, Mike, Mike can probably tell some horror stories of people calling up Know Your Options and saying, well, you know, I just did this, and I thought it was safe, and it turns out they didn't read the fine print. Um, and that's something you really have to do on any ETF, especially these commodity ETFs, right, Mike? Yeah, I think I think oh, the uh, pro. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, hey, you know, typically on, on the know your option side of it, we're managing the money, but um, we're also uh, as registered reps of Brokers Express, we've gotten a couple of those calls, but um, typically. We don't use like the double inverse ETFs too frequently, uh, just from the standpoint that in long-term management, it usually isn't a very good fit. Now, uh, back in my days at Options Express, when I, when I was talking with a lot of people, and, and these first came out, like uh, you had said about two or three years ago, there was a lot of confusion going on with them, uh, just because you think that, okay, I'm going to buy this double ETF, and 10 days from now, if the market goes up 5%, mine should be up 10%. And so just with the confusion that was going on about how they're reset on a daily basis, that was something that uh, didn't really seem to fit in the same way. And uh, 
there was a lot of confusion, but I'll say this for the ETF companies. They've done a pretty good job over the last few years of getting the word out and uh, alleviating a lot of the confusion. So it started mm -hmm. out. So I, it's it's not a perfect product by any means, but it's very intriguing, especially uh, for someone if you want to do some type of a complex hedge in an IRA, or just for whatever reason your the futures side of it just isn't for you and your and your objectives. And it's definitely been a nice alternative for sure. Yeah, I mean what what we've noticed and what we started, you know, people that got in had questions about ETFs would call in. We would let them know that you know. For a long-term hold, these might not be the best thing for you. I mean, we've seen, you go look at a chart ETF and of uh, natural gas, and you can see that the sell-off that occurred a year ago, you really didn't see it in UNG. And we noticed that the ProShares and the other ETF websites had changed uh, their overview of their ETFs. And I'm looking at the ProShares website right now. It says, this ETF seeks a return of 100% of the return of the index target for a single day. Big bold letters. Due to compounding the daily returns, ProShares returns over a period other than one day will likely differ in the amount. So if it differs in the amount more than one day, you can imagine if you're holding this for three months, your return mm -hmm. is not going to match that commodity. And that was the big wake-up call for a lot of investors that were holding this long term. Right. Absolutely. Um, other calls that we're seeing this week have just been a, a lot of put buying, like we're seeing in the turn in the market we, we discussed slightly earlier. Um, you know, the September... Uh, historically has been a month that was a corrective month, a, a down month, a negative month, however you want to say it. Um, looking at the news reports, reading the articles, it's been the best month since, I believe, like 1930. Uh, mm -hmm. Now up almost 8%. Um, all the indexes as a whole, the NASDAQ, um, you know, totally caught people off guard. We were in a bearish market. We were at our lows of the summer, uh, tr you know, trading uh, range that we've been in. People were, were saying, oh, here's a setup to get to get short because September we've gone down, we're going to do it again. Uh, you know, great opportunity to say uh, what, history doesn't repeat itself or past results aren't indicative of future returns. I mean, the market just took off, so we had a lot of people excited. But now we're at, you know, we're past the top of the range. A lot of people are saying, hey, I, my stocks have run up, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent. You know, how, how can I hedge my portfolio? I got $250,000 worth of, uh, of long stock positions. You know, help me get in some SPX puts. I just want to, you know, take a short-term uh, protective stance in case we have a corrective move before we continue higher. If that's their, if that's the way they see it uh, going forward. You guys ever yeah, have your I mean, uh, portfolios? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't really deal with any of the portfolio stuff. I deal with kind of shorter-term trading and for guys that want to use options to kind of make bets on different types of things. But yeah, you know, I just I just see these guys get in into these and not understand how the different types of of uh, double longs, double shorts, triple longs, triple shorts, how the options are supposed to move, how the you know how the uh, uh, the underlying will track, and so I, I think the point here is, is I, I think you said it and Mike said it and I'm saying it. Do your homework, right? Just exactly. Yeah, you know. Exactly. Know, know what you trade and trade what you know. I mean, if you're in there and you're, you're expecting it, you better have uh, reason to back that up. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Uh, any, are you guys seeing anything else uh, over at uh, Options Express? Or, uh... Uh, we, we got a lot of anticipation for the non-farm payroll. Um, you know, caught a few uh, retail investors off guard with them not having it at 7.30 last uh, Friday, which was, you know, the, the first Friday of the month. That's when the non-farm payroll comes out. So we had a lot right. of people calling in. Why didn't we see the number? And, you know, I've seen this happen before, and it just seems to be that the Fed re uh, delays the release um, when it falls on the first Friday of each month. I'm not sure what the reasoning is behind that, but uh, I think it's their wait for a better number to appear, and they're hoping that they can uh, tweak it a little bit. But, um, you know, we should probably see a little bit of slowdown, you know, around Wednesday, Thursday, in anticipation of that. Really would like to see a good number come out from that non-farm payroll, something positive, just so we can, uh, you know, hopefully put a little more momentum behind this uh, short-term rally that we've had. Okay. All right. And with, uh, with that, let's move on to the strategy block. Hmm, the strategy block.
What do you got for us, Mike? Yeah, Mike, what do you got? I got all I need, I need, I need a winner this week. It was a rough week last week. Uh, well, <laughs> the key is, is to buy low and sell high. Oh. Do we need to know anything else? I mean, I mean I've always said a buy down. high and, buy, and sell higher, or a sell high, sell low and, oh, and buy lower. Complicated. I gotta agree with Mark. It's never too high to buy. People are like, oh, it's just run up, it's run up. That's when you get in. Ah, oh, it's too complicated. Too high to buy. Is that a Doug Benson movie or something? <laughs> too high to buy. I don't know who Doug Benson is. <laughs> We won't go there, but on a serious note, uh, the strategy of the week this week I have is the mighty credit spread. Uh, the credit spread is something that I know I've seen throughout my career as uh, an easy money style of trade, and I actually lived the credit spread lifestyle for about three months when I first got into trading myself about seven or eight years ago. I remember uh, a little bit about my story. I was just realizing that professional football is not going to be my career, and so I got into option trading, and I'm pulling in about three to $4,000 a month doing credit spreads, and I just couldn't figure out why the rest of the world was so stupid, and I was so smart. Are you and, sure you don't want to maybe go and walk over to uh, Hallis Hall and see if they need a little help, <laughs> by the way? <laughs> yeah, it might be a good time to rehash that, rehash that based on what I'm seeing from the O-line of the Bears. Yeah, they are having some problems, that's for sure. But. Ugh. Sorry. I thought the Bears set a record last night. Most sacks in a game, right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh, that was them getting sacked. I'm, 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 uh, they, they were long sacks. They wanted to be short sacks. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. But, hey, you know, with that, I learned my lesson early in my trading career. I had a $6,000 loss one day. And so I didn't lose the farm, so to speak. But that quickly made me realize that you can actually lose on a credit spread. And so... Typically, the way that I think you need to have the mentality of a credit spread is winning in a credit spread is easy. You just don't do anything and let it expire worthless. That's the easy part. However, when it goes the wrong way, you need to have a plan for it. So, for example, uh, what a credit spread is, we'll just do uh, the bull put spread. If XYZ stock is trading at $55 a share, you can sell the 50 put for, let's say, $2. Now, with that, you get $2 of income. However, if that's all you do, you have $48 of downside risk. So one thing that you can do is buy the 45 put for, let's just say, a dollar, and then you are hedged from 45 on down to zero. Now, by doing that, the net credit you get is $1, and your net risk is $4. It's the difference between the 45 and 50 strike minus the credit that you get. So you're essentially risking $4 to make $1, and all the stock has to do is stay above 50. It can even go down almost 10%, and you can still make your full profit on the month. Sounds like great easy money, huh? Well, not quite. The problem with the credit spread is that you need to have the plan in case the stock starts going down to 53 $51, $50.22. And what I want to share with you are some thoughts of what you can do should it go against you. Now, the first thought that I have of how you can manage credit spread risk is probably the most simple, and that is to do absolutely nothing. Now, you might be saying, well, holy cow, won't you lose 100% of your trade if you do absolutely nothing and the stock goes down to $45? Well, yes, you will. You will lose everything. You will have 100% loss on the spread. So how can I be a fiduciary responsible guy, so to speak, and advise that it could be okay to lose 100% on a trade? Well, the way with which I think it's justifiable to do it is that you just have such a small, minute amount of your capital in the trade in the first place that it's okay. So that way, if let's say it's a real high-flying stock that goes all over the place, it goes up 20% one day, down 10 the next, and so on down the line, you can still do a credit spread on it. It's just that you have such a small amount of capital involved to where, let's say, the stock goes down to 45.50, and you're thinking, oh, I hope this thing comes back, and you have reason to believe that it might come back based upon the charts, based upon your analysis, that's fine. Just make sure that you have such a small amount of capital involved to where if you do lose everything and you have to hope for it to come back, in this case, hope won't rhyme with dope because you weren't enough of a dope to put that much money in in the first place. So I think that's probably the simplest way to manage risk on credit spreads is by putting just a, an extreme small amount in, and that way you can sit back and you can kind of maybe learn a little bit more about it if you've never done it already. And if you want to take it to the next level, you can always use virtual trading. Options Express has 
was, were, was the pioneers in the virtual trade platform. It's a free service, and I still use virtual trade to this day to study various complex option trades, and I'm not able to say enough good things about it. Now, the second way with which... Yeah, the only, the only problem... I the only, I'll just cut you off. The only problem I have the virtual trade is, I, I can't get. I keep trying to make a virtual withdrawal of the of my profits, and I and they won't send them to me. I, so they need to correct that. And I'm trying to work on that. Oh my speak. gosh, they haven't got that fixed yet. <laughs> no, sorry to cut you off, Mike. But oh, I, I lobbied for I, that years ago. Good I've gosh. hit some great winners. Can't get my money into my account. I don't know. It's too oh, difficult. Well, I'll tell you what. True story. When I when I was working with Options Express, and I would say, you know what, we're working on getting that feature in so you can actually take withdrawals from your virtual account. You should have seen how big the eyes got in the room, and then they just kidding. Oh, that's funny. They didn't think it was as funny as I did, but um, but yeah, that's. I think that's. It's a great feature. Now let's take this to the next level. The next thing that you can do. Let's say you have a little bit more capital, and only you, the trader or investor can determine how much is a little, how much is a lot. Uh, you can have the help of an advisor if he does options with you, but let's say you have a little bit more in there. Well, one thing you can do is as soon as the credit spread gets down to the short strike price. So for example, if XYZ is at 55, and as soon as it gets down to the 50 level, that's when you get out. Now granted, if it's at 50 the day before expiration, it's likely that you'll have a profit for the month. If it's at 50 the day after you make the trade and you still got four weeks left till expiration, it's even more likely that you're going to have a big fat loss on the month. Now, is the loss going to be as much as what it would be if the stock went down to 45? No, but it's, a, it's another way with which it can kind of work for a beginning credit spreader to get out beforehand and use risk management. Now, Murphy's Law dictates that as soon as you get out when it's at 50, the stock's automatically going to go back to 54 the next day. So with that, you need to have reasons as to why you would want to get out, technically speaking, fundamentally speaking, whatever the case may be. And I kind of view of the three risk management forms that I like to tell people about using the credit spread, I kind of like to have this one in, kind of in the middle to where I would view this as a little bit more aggressive. Now, um, or I'm sorry, a little bit less aggressive than the uh, one we just described and a little bit more aggressive than the one I'm about to describe. Now, the final one is something that they talk about. It's actually on the CBOE website, and it's become pretty popular with uh, iron condors in a lot of circles, managing it based upon delta. Let's say, for example, that you start out with the short strike price having a uh, positive 7 delta, and I'm just making up numbers. Uh, what you can do is just continually monitor the delta of that short strike price and as soon as it gets to the 25 level or the 30 level or whatever level you want to use, that's when you get out. Now, ideally, that number is going to become closer and closer to the 50 level, 50 in terms of the stock price, the closer you get to expiration. So hopefully a 7 delta option four weeks out is going to be a lot, have a lot more uh, wiggle room, so to speak, than a 7 delta option would say, one week out. So the third way, and this is a little bit more advanced, and this is kind of how we like to do it when we do credit spreads, is that you monitor it based upon the deltas. So quick review, the three ways with which we like to look at delta, or I'm sorry, look at credit spread risk. First way, do absolutely nothing, but just have a small, 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 small amount of capital at risk. Second way, use the short strike price as kind of a guideline as to when you can either make an adjustment or get out. And the third way, use delta to monitor your position. Now, all these, we can actually have another strategy block maybe in another few weeks on what are some adjustments that you can make when you get into situations like this. But the point is, is that you have a plan as to when you're going to get out beforehand. And all of a sudden, one day, you just don't wake up and you have parentheses in your account and you're getting margin calls uh, if it's after expiration and you weren't ready for any of this. So. Uh, I'd strongly recommend the importance of a plan before doing a trade, and uh, that's my take on the credit spread risk management. Yeah, always, always important to have a plan before you enter into. Is that enough? Yeah, I mean it's it's super. I couldn't agree more. If you know, if you don't plan ahead, then you know, what's the old saying? Uh, proper proper planning prevents piss poor performance permanently. Isn't that what they used Proper to say? Proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. There you go. Permanently. Five P's. Oh, this is yeah. the sixth P. Wow. 
Yeah, I'm a six P guy. You maybe if maybe you're a five P or I'm a six P. -er. I'm a five. How's that? How do you take that? I, I, I guess um, it only helps me temporarily, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't plan that long term. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and with that, let's go into the Around the Block. Around the Block. I think that everybody here is going to have the same thing on their mind going into the, uh, you know, this week. And that is one thing, non-farm payrolls. I think that's going to be the driver. That's going to be what runs things, and and I, you know that's going to be kind of what ends up defining this week. Uh, you know, we could be up and down all week. Um, everything could change in the blink of an eye on uh, on the Friday. Yeah, like yeah we're going to get a uh, we're going to get a small preview on. Uh, on Wednesday with that ADP, which has become uh, increasingly more important as they refine that number. I remember when that came out uh, five years ago, I paid no attention to it. But it seems uh, as years pass, that ADP employment change is becoming more important. They seem to um, you know, kind of give you an, an eye to what the uh, non-farm payroll number is going to be on Friday. But what are they expecting? So non-farm, I'm looking, uh, market expects uh, no jobs created, none lost, but I'm, you know, I've seen some numbers anywhere from down to twenty thousand to. I'm yeah. Let me pull this up. I'm looking at the briefing. The consensus, yeah, the consensus uh, or the briefing.com forecast is sixty thousand. The consensus is around seventy. So yeah, that's kind of what we're what we're looking at is, is some sort of net of sixty thousand non-farm private payrolls. Um, for non-farm net payrolls, I think it's negative. 18,000 or somewhere in that range is in between zero and negative 18,000. So, you so get the private that's obviously government work uh, yeah. coming out and then private payrolls creating. It's interesting that, that we never reported private payrolls until really this uh, government kind of, uh, let's just say, spending uh, kind of became such a major part of the economy. Yeah, I don't even think I've ever noticed that private payrolls up there. I just kind of, I mean, how long has it been up there for? That's the first time I've ever seen it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> when you said 60, I said, no way, it's negative, you know, 20 or negative 18. 18. Or, yeah, no, I'm looking at yeah. non-farm non and then non-farm private non -farm. payrolls. Wow. Which I guess is, you know, it, obviously that goes to show you on how big of a dent government is, is putting in on, on the employment picture right now. Yeah. Which is a bad, you know, not a good thing. Um, well, we don't, you know, who needs teachers and cops and firefighters? I mean, really, what do, what do, what do they do? They're only the foundation of society. What's the old saying? How many, how many uh, government workers does it take to uh, change a light bulb? Ten. One to, uh, one to change a light bulb and nine to evaluate and run studies and, uh, no, I'm sorry. So, you know, what are you guys seeing around the block? What are you guys seeing coming up? Well, another thing, you know, obviously, yeah, non-farm role, spotlights on uh, Friday morning, 7.30 Central. But with crude oil trading in the, in the low 80s, uh, you know, we also got to watch out for crude inventories. Uh, DOE, EIA comes mm -hmm. out at 9, 9.35, I believe. They, they kind of like to... Yeah, uh, they can throw a monkey it. wrench in it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, ex I'm expecting them to have some big inventories, distillates uh, and crude. So, you know, I, mean, I would think of like a little uh, knee-jerk reaction, so maybe a nice little sell-off. You know, jump in there, buy some futures, and uh, and then watch it go back to unchanged as, as you see some huge volatility when that number comes out. Yeah. What about you, Mike? All right. Uh, All right. That's what I'm seeing, too, for the most part. I mean, I think that the only, like you said, the only other thing that I think could throw the monkey wrench at is the crude inventories. And stuff. Yep. Not doing much today. Um, and after, in comparison to what the euro did, I mean, that's, that's a, definitely raises an eyebrow, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, on that note, um, that is the option block. Uh, Mark will be back from uh, Chasing Rats. Uh, <laughs> so, no, anyway, Mark Lago will be back uh, on Thursday at, with our kind of regular format. This was something we've done free form as our kind of final preview show. And, uh, 
as, you know, as we ramp up to uh, get into the show proper. And so we will see you next time. Become a part of the Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved.